you can still get cancer, of course, because it's not truly a bulletproof uh, vest that you're putting on internally and externally. However, what I have seen across the board, except when people have a genetic mutation um, underlying their cancer causation, which is not most people, remember about 8%. So when I see someone who has really been following the whole food plant-based prescription along with exercise and sleep and social connection and um, avoidance of toxic substances, including and especially when it comes to breast cancer, alcohol, and they still get breast cancer. Okay. I have a ever growing number of women with these cancers that if you just gave me the path report blinded to age, I would say, is she 110? Like this is a little old lady, lazy cancer that if you had never diagnosed it, would never kill this person until she's 250. So even for the best of us currently doing what we do on earth, no one's making it to 250, right? And honestly, like literally today, I got a path report from a lady who flew down from Seattle um, because she, it was whole food plant-based. She's ripped, like envious of her biceps. Um, she's 53. And came to me, though, actually crying and scared because she felt this lump. It was so tiny and it was ultrasound negative. I could feel it. It was this little big between a pea and a marble like that size. And I would so I knew exactly where to go, held it between my fingers, put the ultrasound probe down and it wasn't there. And I biopsied it anyway. The biopsy came back invasive breast cancer, but it was a subtype that's tubular, behaves almost like a stage zero in situ cancer through the roof with estrogen receptors, which is what a less aggressive, more curable breast cancer will show. But here's the key, the division rate, the percentage of cells that were actively dividing. So one becoming two under the microscope was, I I'd never seen this, less than 1%. Like I've never seen a number that low. I've seen actually a couple of 1%, but this was less than 1%. This thing is so slow. And what that means is in a 53 year old is that less than 1% of the cells are duplicating over about a three to four month period. So that's in insanely slow. If you do the, the math on that, let's just do easier math and say it was 10% dividing a one centimeter cancer in about three months will be 1.1 centimeters because 10% of the cells are dividing, but in her, it's less than 1%. Why? Because of her diet and lifestyle. And that's where I like made her wipe her tears away. And I'm like, listen to me, this is probably cancer because it feels like it, but let's biopsy it and prove it. And even if it comes back cancer, I can actually promise this woman, she it's impossible for her to die from it. And that is what I'm finding with my patients. I think they need a good 10 years of that real cleaned up internal um, low level inflammation to then create a cancer that's pretty wimpy. Like if its goal is to kill you, is not going to happen. Thank you. Um, what is your experience in the real world with people that say, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really think the whole food plant base is the way to go. I'm a total believer in the paleo keto low carb diets, and they have their gurus that they follow, the the books they follow. Do, what do you see when you? treat them when you look at their scans, when you look at their numbers, how are they doing? I mean, there's a lot of people, if you go to Amazon, look at the bestsellers, it's always filled with keto and paleo books. Um, and they're very confident and they speak very strongly. What is your experience about the health of the people who are using this approach? Dr. Freeman, do you want to take that first and ask these people about yeah. their coronary artery calcium scores? <laughs> Yeah. So the truth is um, no professional society on the planet endorses uh, a paleo or keto diet with the exception of for one or two rare neurologic diseases. And the reason for that is the evidence base is not there. It's dangerous. And yes, when people do follow a very low carbohydrate diet, they tend to cut out the garbage carbs that I commonly call garbage and they end up losing weight. And when they lose weight, sometimes some of the risk factors get better. There are some people that I know that can somehow subsist on this diet although they are probably markedly increasing their cancer risk as they eat things like bacon wrapped scallops every day, 
Um, you know, scallops in themselves are very high in cholesterol and bacon is considered to be in the same category as cigarettes by the World Health Organization for its cancer causing. And so in general, these people are um, putting themselves at great risk. And then from a cardiovascular perspective, many of these people feel miserable, uh, even after the initial keto flu that they endure. Uh, and then many of them have LDLs, bad cholesterol that goes up three, 400 points. Uh, I've even seen some people have heart attacks while on this diet. And of course, it's hard to say the diet caused this, but it's quite likely in my mind. Um, and so in general, there are some people out there that have some sort of genetics that allows them to feel okay on this plan, but the vast majority of, of people I have not seen positive results ever really. So. Agreed. And when you ask how I approach these patients who are really clinging to their current diet, I don't try that hard to dissuade them because I think there's a pretty thick wall between my mouth and their ears. But I do beg them, I, you know, if you're going to continue on this diet, just promise me that you will regularly be checking your blood work. And in particular, I want you to promise me that in three months, you'll do a coronary artery calcium score, which is going to be more important than maybe the cholesterol checks, because sometimes in keto diets, as Dr. Freeman was saying, the profiles like the HDL, LDL, overall cholesterol, they, they can look improved because they are getting rid of a lot of the garbage obsessed. That is a funny, great term. Never heard it. Um, and an oral glucose tolerance test because your diabetics can actually seem to have less insulin resistance and lower their insulin requirements if they're insulin dependent. But when you really put it to the gold standard test of eating liquid sugar, um, and watching what their insulin response is over the ensuing few hours, you will find that they're worse than they were before. So again, what Dr. Freeman was saying in part is that we lack any long-term data. There are no randomized controlled trials making keto and paleo the uh, knockout winners. All the trials are very short-lived, weeks to months at best, um, partly because it's not a sustainable diet. Um, and I think partly because maybe as certain people think about doing such a study and maybe do some uh, individualized testing on patients, or they find that the data isn't the way they want. So they're not putting it out there. I don't know uh, why we don't have long-term data on keto and paleo diets, but I think it's dangerous. And when you ask how I approach a patient, I say, well, I think the balance of evidence in nutritional science points away from animal-based keto eating and toward plants. And um, here's my book. <laughs> Maybe you want to read chapters three and four. You know, I'm gentle on them. It's, uh, that's not their moment to uh, come to kale and you know it. So I just give them a little bit of advice. Thank you. Um, what about uh, salt? In other words, uh, a lot of people say to avoid it completely. And then there are some authors that say that it's it's a, it's okay or it's not that big a deal. I personally eat a whole food plant based diet. I'm very very serious about sugar, but if the guacamole has salt or the flax crackers have salt, I kind of think, ah, eh, maybe it's not that big a deal. So, in terms of heart disease and cancer, do you have any? Um, what is your thought on the effect of of, of salt? If you look at the population holes, right, Americans consume far too much salt. The number one source of most salt in most Americans that is actually in the form of poultry, uh, which has been brined or injected before it's consumed most of the time. But assuming you're not eating that stuff, um, you know, the occasional sprinkle of salt is probably not nearly as bad as the food that contains salt. And so my guess is in your guacamole or occasional flax crackers or whatever, you're probably not getting that much salt. But the vast majority of Americans are consuming too much. And from a population level, many of those people then have high blood pressure, which markedly accelerates cardiovascular disease risk. And so in general, I usually tell people to try to limit it to, you know, 2000 milligrams or so. There is some data that in people who have perfectly normal kidneys and don't suffer from hypertension, that salt loads may not be as harmful as we once thought. But in general, the advice that I would give everybody listening is we all eat way too much salt and things that you don't think are salty are super salty. As an example, one, you know, you guys are, many of you are in New York, one, uh, you know, sour pickle could have a full day's worth of salt. Um, you know, our bowl of raisin bread can have 600 milligrams, two slices of bread can have four to 600 milligrams. And so it's very, very, very easy to pile up the salt. 
So when you eat a largely unprocessed and unpackaged diet, it's much more difficult uh, to get that salt. And I probably wouldn't worry too much about the occasional sprinkle people add to things. But if you're a big restaurant foodie type, you got to be careful because they salt the heck out of everything. Yeah, interestingly, a study just came out on Monday, so April 8th, 2024, um, that was looking at, um, it's a meta-analysis of a number of randomized controlled trials, and they showed that um, people who use salt substitutes, and by the way, the substitute was 25% potassium chloride, 75% sodium chloride. So interesting, because you still, sodium chloride is the bad one, right? So um, so it was heavy on the on the salt salt when we were talking about salt, the sodium. And yet what they found is that after up to 10 years use of salt substitutes had a statistically significant drop in all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease for those who substituted their salts. We um, in our house, because, you know, the um, if you look at how dietary choices impact mortality, the top five things that lead to an early unwelcome death that we have control over and are 100% diet related. One is an excess and four are lax. So the number one cause of dietary death on planet earth is excessive salt. And when I read that, um, this was when I was studying for my uh, board certification in lifestyle medicine. When I read that, I bought bags, like two pound bags worth of potassium chloride and filled all the salt containers in the house with it. And um, nobody was the wiser, except after I told them. And all of a sudden, Sebastian, especially was like, oh, I knew this tasted awful. And he's such a little rat because he was, he salts every, oversalts everything. He's like, mom, I'm an athlete. I sweat a lot. I need extra salt. And um, he had no idea. So I challenge you to try that or try a mixture of potassium chloride versus, and now that you, everybody's like, well, what are the other four? The other four, I forget which order exactly, but it was not enough. So first is too much salt. That was number one. And then I think the order was not enough fruit, not enough whole grains, not enough vegetables and get this, not enough nuts. That was number five. Um, but of course it's not roasted salted nuts or that would bring you back to number one. 